I bet you that the trainees in the room know a lot more spine surgery than I did when I was at your stage. You know, it's amazing how much we know now, but I'm gonna to propose to you that if you really want to help your patients, the next jump is not gonna be technical how to put in a screw. You can get more good for your patients by leading a good team. And you know, these are the soft skills that maybe aren't quite as fun and maybe you're not directly paid for them, but the soft skills will get you further. So my disclosures for this is I am a piecemeal laborer, I am useless without my team, and I'm still working on every slide in this talk to do better myself. So you're a team leader. You know, and it's hard to make that jump from being the guy at the bottom of the pyramid to the person who's leading a team. And we're gonna talk about creating a culture of preparation, empowering your team members, unrelenting pursuit of excellence, and some leadership pearls and pitfalls. So as a new team leader, on one hand, you know, you're scared. You have imposter syndrome. We all do. Like, oh my God, I'm the person in the OR and the person who's asleep, their life is in my hands. You know, versus overconfidence. If you're overconfident, yeah, the OR is not going to like you. People are going to subtly work against you. You know, yell at a scrub tech once and that scrub tech is no longer your friend and things may just not show up. And I think it's particularly hard for women in our culture in the OR. They seem to be judged a little bit tougher. And as uh, David Arquette said in a movie, all you need is one person to say that they're really cool and everyone else will be afraid to disagree. So I think here's a chance we could all support each other and let the OR you know, think that all of us you know, who are good you know, really are good and deserve the support, especially when someone comes in new to a new OR hospital. So surgeons, think that they're doing a better job of teamwork than everyone else in the room thinks. Like, look at the uh, residents there. Less than 10% think that there's good teamwork in the OR. So I think that we have to take a little bit of a humble pill. We could probably do better than we think we're doing. If you haven't read this book, it's fantastic, Atomic Habits. It's not atomic like boom. It's like, you know, little small habits. And it's the idea you do not rise to the level of your goals. We all have hefty goals. You fall to the level of your systems. And if you really want to help your patients, get systems in place. So we have systems where we now have spine education classes. Before any patient has pediatric spine surgeon, they're offered the possibility of coming in a night or a weekend, run by nurses, you know, no MDs, they're scary. People ask nurses questions, they won't ask MDs. Uh, Gallup poll every year except for 9-11. Nurses are the most respected profession in the United States, and you'll do well to learn. You know, nurses are gonna hear things and be able to say things that more effectively than we are sometimes. Now, checklists, you know, someone tells you to do a checklist, you want to punch them in the nose, we have too many checklists these days. Um, but I do find it helpful to give parents a checklist. They don't have too many. So the parents know what we're going to do with the patients every single day, and they're not going to let us forget something. And then you recruit family members to be part of the care team instead of being, you know, us against them, different silos. We're on the same team. We all want the patient to get better. Um, when I, you go to a new place, you may have a new way of doing things, whether it's your first job or you know, second or third job. When I first came in, we ran a trial pediatric spine surgery. Now, I felt a little bit, you know, am I trying to be too special here and make it all a bit about me? But the team loved it. And of everyone in that room four and a half years ago, there's only one person who's not on the team, and they went to a different company. It was interesting. A lot of the other surgeons like, Wow, that's brilliant. I wish I thought about that. So the team wants to be valued. They want to be thought of as a team. And don't hesitate to put too much attention and time into that. Um, a culture of preparation. You've probably all had that uncomfortable moment when you're in a case and the surgeon goes, hand me that, and it's not in the room. They get angry. Why is it in the room? Now, you know that if the surgeon asks for it ahead of time, it probably would have been in the room. So I started sending an email to my scrub tech, and then the nurse wanted it, and the equipment person wanted it, and the ICU person wanted it. You know, I now have sent it to about 60 people. On Saturday or Sunday morning, I sit down, takes an hour or two, you know, look at every MRI, CT, every note, every clearance, and write step by step what we're gonna do for every patient, send it to them. I 
have to put in writing. It forces me to look at things step by step. I sleep on it, and almost every single week, somebody sends me back a better idea, something to do differently. And if nothing else, it lets everyone on the team feel respected, that I cared enough to share the plan with them so we all get to think about it ahead of time. And how many times fluoro comes in? You're like, do this, do that, do this. You know, you're saying 10 different things. The patient's getting useless radiation. You're getting frustrated. We had a spine grand rounds where we brought in the fluoro text and we all agreed on a common language. We put this poster up in every room. I could send it to you if you email me. I still get it wrong sometimes. I still have to look at it. But just having a common language helps. There's been studies showing if you do this, the patient gets less radiation and the techs feel respected. They feel like we're all on the same team. Now, surgeons believe they should not be questioned. Airline pilots, unless you fly for Korean Air, you know, very happy being questioned. Um, and surgeons, we could do better on this. And it's amazing to me um, that we have not changed this culture. And psychological safety. At Google, the greatest predictor of team performance was psychological safety, meaning you could speak up and not be made fun of. You could speak up, say something wrong, and it's going to be valued. Uh, this morning, I was doing a, uh, a meeting with the SRS leadership program. It's, it's for young people. If you ever get the chance, jump at it. It's a year-long program. They bring in great speakers. There's a former Green Beret named Steve Forty that was talking on sleep. And there's a study out there that's fantastic that was done blindly. And if the leader had a good night of sleep or not, the employee could tell. So the employee was, fill, was filling out, is my boss a good boss today or is my boss cranky? And it correlated very well to the leader's sleep. So one thing you could do is get a good night's sleep, not just for physical reasons, but also for mental reasons. And when most physicians behave badly, um, they believe they're justified because they're doing it to protect their patient. Watch out for that trap. You're going to find yourself doing it. You know, you're mad because the patient's going to be hurt over this. But, you know, maybe justified, but you being mad isn't going to help anything. You know, now we have two problems. Now we have a mad surgeon. So anytime a surgeon is abusive in the OR, the study's shown, you can never undo it. You can never get it back. Good leadership after that isn't going to change something. If you find yourself losing your temper in the OR, which we've all done, stop right then, say, I am sorry. I shouldn't have done that. I got frustrated. You know, criticize privately, praise publicly, apologize publicly and immediately. Once you do that, you might even gain respect. So, you know, how do you kind of tone things down? Two of my daughters have come and watched me in the OR and they're like, Dad, the residents are scared of you. I'm like, really? Why would they be scared of me? But I thought about it, and you do have to kind of lower yourself a little bit. And if I'm with a new team now, I tell people, like, I need all the help I can get. I'm someone's husband. People can relate to that. I make mistakes all the time. Please help. And how do you get everyone in the, in the OR to speak up? You know, if I'm not sure if those screws look good, or if I'm not sure if we're at L4, and I said, we're at L4, right? You know, who's going to say no? But if you ask the most junior person in the room, what level are we at? And then have everyone else in the room say, what level are we at? We're more likely to get the truth instead of agreement. Empower everybody in the room. And, uh, you know, when we do pediatric spines, we want the maps around 50 or 60 when you dissect, minimize blood loss. Once we start changing the shape of the spine, get it up to 70s. And we used to just tell, you know, anesthesia that, and I'd say, hey, the pressure's up. Like, yeah, pressures are up. If I'd look over, like, no, the maps are in the 50s. I'd say, oh, well, we're getting them up. Now we have the maps up on a screen, everybody in the OR could see, and everyone looks at it. As we start to cut the rod, people say, hey, the pressure's coming up. Have multiple eyes, all giving input, doing the same thing at the same time. And the, the crisis management. You know, here's a neuromonitoring, or a checklist for if you lose neuromonitoring. Again, happy to email this to you. It should be up in every spine deformity OR in the world. Why not? So if you lose signals, these are the steps that you should take, and it should be read by a nurse, you know, not by you, because especially when you first start, when you lose signals for a while, it's going to be scary. Your adrenaline's going to flow. You're going to be sweating. You're going to hope that nobody knows how much you're panicking. When I lose signals now, I no longer have adrenaline flow. You know, I've lost signals 200 times. That's why I have gray hair. 
But what we should do is repeat back critical communications. I can't tell you how many lawsuits I've seen where the surgeon says, they never told me you lost signals. Neuromonitoring says, I told the surgeon we lost signals. You know, when you're talking to neuromonitoring, one, they're the most important voice in the room, shut up and listen, and two, repeat it back. We lost signals? Yes, we lost signals. Okay, got it, we lost signals. Repeat back and forth. It's not nerdy. You know, it's been shown in crisis management, military situations. That's how you make sure you communicate correctly. And make it good judgment, not a weakness to phone a friend. Uh, we have agreed at Cedars that if anybody loses signals for a significant amount of time, they call in a friend. You know, we're running seven spine rooms in a day. If I lose signals for a while, I say, please call in another attending. You know, they may do nothing different other than run the list themselves. Just make sure that I didn't miss anything because when you lose signals, you may not be thinking your clearest. Bring in a friend, it's a sign of strength. I learned this from a, a team leader of the Blue Angels. After every time they do an event or a show, they have a debrief that's about 35, 45 minutes, and the leader starts off saying, what could I have done better? After every surgery, as I take off my you know, gloves, and I say, what could I do better? Usually there's something I could do better. Other people in the room say what they could do better. And it's astounding. People come up with ideas that I wouldn't have thought of. Um, and it also creates a culture of not only putting the patient first, but putting yourself lower. And we're all here and allow ourselves to be vulnerable. Be honest with each other. Psychological safety. And getting towards the end, run towards your complications, especially as a young attending when you have your first big complication. You're going to feel like vomiting. You're going to want to run away and not come back. And that's when you need to see a patient twice as much. That's when your patient, you know, you could give your cell phone to the family, say, I'm here. I think you should admit that you emotionally care about the person and be transparent. And it's a great time to deepen your relationship with your partners. Even if there's a partner you don't like, tell your partner, hey, I had a complication. Could you review this? Could you help me out? Maybe the partner would even go see the patient. Your partner will respect you, and you'll deepen your relationship. And a good way to have everyone lose respect for you is show up late all the time. If you show up late, it's either you don't respect anyone else's time or you're incompetent. You're telling people, my time is not as valuable as yours. Uh, when I was a surgical resident at Columbia, you know, you had to round at like five in the morning. There was one senior resident that would show up 20 minutes late every time. Wow, did we not like him. I was pretty happy five years later, someone called me, wanted to hire him. I said, eh, I wouldn't hire that guy. Not a team player, never got the job. It's a real quick way for everyone to lose respect for you. Um, so, you know, how do we get things done in the hospital? It is quick and easy to do an email or a text, but that's also a quick way for people to misinterpret, you know, feel that it's confrontational, solidify silos. It takes a lot longer to have a personal meeting. But if you need to talk about something important, it should be one-on-one. -on -one. You know, most communication is not verbal. Most of it's physical and emotional. And if you're not in front of someone, you really risk them missing the message and you risk them misinterpreting it. The problem is this takes a long time. And if you're having an important meeting, you may need to sit down with everyone individually ahead of time, do the meeting before the meeting to figure out where they stand so you know how the meeting's gonna end up. That's leadership, it takes time. And somebody mentioned this before, my relationship is more important than this issue. This is a great technique. You're not going to believe how well it works until you try it. If you're meeting someone and you really are on opposite sides about something, I'll just say, you know what? My relationship with you is more important than this issue. We'll do it your way. Almost 100% of the time, the person goes, oh, hold on. I, I see your point. And you kind of come back to the middle. Try it. It's wonderful. And the goal after you interact with people is for them to feel better about themselves. You want to be sticky. You want people to be around you, to, to help you, to listen to you, to have fun together. And there's studies showing that something just as simple as smiling changes people's perspective of your interaction. So I'd like to thank my partners. We just had a big dinner in Park City. Uh, we have a meeting every year now with the Columbia Group, the Duke Group, and the Cedars Group. And show up. It's lots of fun. Thank you.
But I'd like to thank David for his always um, motivational and uh, outstanding personal emotional intelligence conveying uh, self. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Questions, comments? You got him here. Motivated? Then let's, oh, I'm here. So thank you for the great talk. I think some of these things are, are just so obvious. Um, you know, we're always in a rush, um, you know, as physicians at all times, right? Um, in terms of the post-surgical debrief, um, are you doing that just for your kind of more complex cases where it's a little bit more going on or even, you know, instituting that in kind of smaller, uh, more straightforward cases for you? I do a surgical debrief for every single case. I think the more complex ones we train for so much and think about so much, they might go better. And sometimes the big misses are the little cases that we're not paying so much attention to. No. Thank you. And you know, the debrief, honestly, it's usually about 60 seconds. And it doesn't slow anyone up. The team's still closing while we're talking. Yeah. I want to uh, use the opportunity of having you and uh, Liz here. So you mentioned something very important that I've seen and struggled with on, at times, and that is our female colleagues, where there is a problematic communication that we may have not done directly ourselves. We clearly need to do a much better job, especially in spine, having more female surgeons there. What can we do as male surgeons, and maybe Liz, you want to take the lead for that if I may put you on the spot. What can we as male surgeons do to empower and help our female colleagues when we witness that something ain't quite right? Do we just ignore it and kind of go through, or can we do something active? Yeah, that's a good question, and I'm not sure I have uh, the right answer to it because the answer is probably addressing, again, not the person in the room, like Dr. Skaggs is doing, who's making a mistake in that moment, but rather uh, addressing the issue either you know, privately with them, uh, the person who did it, and ask them you know, why this happened or if they would treat a man the same way, or potentially uh, to leadership to identify if these are systemic issues. Um, but there's not a simple answer to that question. I'm going to give you a little vignette that we experienced a couple of years ago, and I'm not going to identify the very talented, highly bright, great uh, surgical skills female colleague we had here. Uh, this colleague brought uh, to us, and this is what re reminded me of that story, these angled loops. Uh, anybody use those? Those kind of prism loops? I do. Yeah. yeah. So this young fellow was the person who introduced our institution and me to these angled loops, OK? And she got written up for being arrogant in the OR by Source Anonymous, the wonderful um, silent assassination backstabbing. She got uh, written up for being arrogant in the OR. And the debrief that followed in the OR environment, it came out that she always looked around arrogantly. I, you cannot make this stuff up. There were meetings about this. As fellowship director back then, I had this in these meetings. Fact is, when you have these loops on, this is what your head position is. And every little nuance about how she tied the mask, how she held her head high, how she turned her head around when somebody asked her a question was basically picked on just like this. So, Dave, any thoughts? Uh, you're obviously very insightful, uh, super high EI also. How do, we, how do you handle this? What do we prevent? What are you doing wrong? My personal observation, I've asked a number of my female partners over the years, is I think that women surgeons are more harshly judged in the OR. And I don't think there's an easy fix. It's a cultural thing, and I, I'm not sure. You know, I think if first step is recognizing it and you know, maybe go out of our way, just say like, hey, she's really good. You know, she takes great care of patients. You know, she's a great partner. I just, you know, maybe subtly uh, make it a little different culturally. A lot of work to do. On this end, let's do a quick stretch break. Let's do 10 minutes, and then we'll ask the voluminous voice of Dr. Koja Hamilton to pull us back in to hear about the Ten Commandments. Oh, the best. Yes. The best talk. Let's do it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.